All right, y'all. So welcome to the last lecture of DAB for the quarter, the third lecture ever. Uh, we're going to be talking to you about lots of math today. Don't we love our basic math? So first, we're going to play a little game of where in the world, just like last time. So we have, so we've got some pictures of some place in the world, and I am sending out a link to a form in the chat. Um, you can guess where if you can guess where in the world this is. That'll be very impressive. And there's also a, a bonus question in, in this form that would really help us. Just just so you know. So we're gonna take a few minutes just to do that. Uh, see how people respond. Wait, why are you showing the responses, bro? Oh, shoot. I thought I was only sharing the one screen. That was not the case. That was not the case. OK. Then uh, we'll, just, we'll just wait a few minutes for people to give the answer. Bad at geography. That, I mean, honestly, probably same. All right, maybe another minute or so. What country do we live in again? Um, I think we live in Switzerland. But maybe I'm wrong. Good chocolate, yes. Best chocolate. All right. I think we're going to go ahead, move on. So if you didn't know, if you, this is actually in the great country of Jamaica. So kudos to anyone. Uh, other tropical islands would have been a, would have been a fair guess, but this is Jamaica. So, all right. Next, we have some announcements. You've got your first two labs for DAV done. Good job to all of you who have finished. Um, we posted a few days ago a uh, pretty long post, and in there there's a feedback form that's being sent out to all the projects. So please fill out the form. You know, this is the first year we're running DAV, so we obviously know there's a lot of things that can be fixed and a lot of things that can be improved, and your feedback will be important to, uh, to help us improve for the future quarters and future years. Also, re review your teams. We put that in the same Facebook post. We'll be putting uh, you in contact with each other soon, and also let, just let us know if you have any issues with your teams or maybe like how you're going to be set up. Uh, Next time, please don't turn in your labs late or we'll be sad. We spent a lot of time on Monday checking everyone off and still a good few people had needed to turn it in a little late. So kind of please turn, turn it in on time or early. To early is actually better. And then we'll be sending out an important shipping for neck over winter break. So uh, just keep a heads up. It'll, be, it'll do with the parts you'll be getting next quarter. And just remember, stay hydrated. All right, what could possibly be next? What's that? Oh my God, idea hacks! Oh my God! Ah! Oh my God, the biggest hardware hackathon on the West Coast ever, and we ship free parts to you, and you can create a fun project and win a wide array of exciting awards. Oh my God, and you can apply by this Sunday, November 22nd, because we extended the deadline by one week due to popular demand. Oh my God, and the link is right there. This is crazy. Oh God, how, oh my God, how could this lecture get any better? Oh my God, General Ford, what? <laughs> oh my God.
god you mean you can get you, you can get officer mentorship make lifelong friends and join the social aspect of ieee just by joining general board which is next week I mean, which is this Thursday, which is tomorrow. Oh my God, the annual session is tomorrow. Wait, wait dude, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta clear my schedule, guys. I have, to, I have to join, I have to go through the info session. I have to make sure I can join the general board and make lifelong friends and get a wide array of benefits. Oh my God, and the link's right there too. Oh, oh. oh all right. Sorry guys, I got a little, uh, little excited there. All right, on another note, here are some tips from the last lab. So a lot of you guys are kind of like asking about test benches and how they get onto hardware or how they're designed. So just remember that your test bench is made just to like test that your design is working and it's not actually meant to go onto your hardware. So it's really just to test your design before you load it, your design onto an FPGA. Also, your test bench is trying to make sure your design responds properly to every input. So sometimes you have to test all the inputs that may happen. And you may also have to stagger and rearrange the signals to change at different times. So that way you know it responds correctly to each change individually. Also, um, just generally think of your design as a black box and your test bench is the, your inputs. So you're, when you're writing your test bench, you're instantiating your design. And so it, uh, your black box goes kind of into your test bench and then the waveforms let you see how the design changes. Uh, also, some of you took some interesting uh, ways of doing your combinational logic, which was fine, but also the most simplest way is to do the Verilog operator, such as and, or, plus, or minus. So we've actually posted a cheat sheet now on the Facebook group uh, with some helpful syntax as a guide. So you can take a look at that and see what's, uh, very, what's uh, easy to use. Also, pay, make sure uh, sometimes to pay attention to the sizes of your wires and registers because even, even if you think you did your logic completely right, if you don't have the right size wires, then you're not going to get the right output just because it can't hold all the information. Uh, also, it's possible to instantiate modules within other modules. So like with part four, when you are making a big circuit out of the smaller circuits, you could instantiate your clock divider and your hash within the combined module. So that's another uh, tip. And finally, a just because like when you have a register as the output of one of your design modules, if you instantiate it, that doesn't mean it has to be a register on the other side, if that makes sense. You don't have to connect it to a register as well. You can, can still connect that register to a wire when you instantiate it. So those are just some tips um, from the last lab. Hopefully, um, maybe that'll make it easier to do the, la the future labs. And now we're going to go on into our math. So you're going to change the slide or oh, okay. Sorry, guys, I got a little excited just now. I was so excited because uh, I was so, over the prospect of joining idea hacks, which was organized by our very own external vice president. And again, it's the biggest hardware hackathon on the West Coast boasting a wide array of sponsors, such as Qualcomm, Texas Insurance, and Monster Energy. Also, the general board, which is administered by our very own internal vice president. And it boasts a wide roster of officers and dedicated IEEE members that are ready and willing to engage with you, host socials, and provide mentorship. Join GB and and make friends with your fellow GV members and compete against the other GVs to prove that you are the best GV with prizes awarded at the end of the year for the most winningest GV. Okay, now going into numbers, uh, you know, we're going to start with base notation. So, you know, usually because humans, like we usually have 10 fingers, so we count in, in groups of 10, which is the decimal system, right? But with computers, uh, the way they work is they have switches which are flipped on and off. So unfortunately, that's like two fingers. So usually with computers, we count in powers of two. So that's binary. Uh, you know, I'm sure uh, you know you've all kind of seen something like this before. Uh, obviously, the rightmost bit is the one, so two to the zeroth power, and the second digit is the first power, second power, third power, fourth power, etc. And that's how, uh, and you just. If you want to convert it back to decimal, you just add up uh, the corresponding powers 
and uh, you get your, your, your number back. And then, so uh, uh, with, along with binary, it's kind of annoying to really count out a bunch of zeros and ones every time. And so there's also hexadecimal, which is not base two, but it's in base 16. And the cool part about hex, hex about base 16 is that uh, 16 happens to be two to the fourth. So when we're counting in hexadecimal, uh, we can just string together four binary digits together, and that will make one uh, hex digit. So you can see this in this little table here, the first is uh, the first hexadecimal digit, zero. Uh, that corresponds to zero, 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 zero in binary. And then and we count all the way up to zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way to nine. And after nine, we go to A. Uh, we go to A, B, C, D, E, and E represents 15. Uh, in, in when we're counting base 16, obviously we have to roll over uh, every 16, not every 10, not every two. Um, and so uh, when you get up to E, that represents, um, that represents uh, the binary one, 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 one. Or, all right, I feel like we skipped a number here, but all right, whatever. Uh, okay. Now here's an example of us converting between uh, different bases. We're gonna start with 173 uh, in base 10, that's decimal. And first we wanna find uh, the highest power of two that fits into 173. So that's 128, which is two to the seventh. So we have our little uh, kind of table here. We marked a 120 in one, the 128 block, we mark a one and we subtract that from 173. So 173 minus 128, that's 45. And again, we try to find the highest power of two that fits into 45. Uh, that's 32, which is two to the fifth. And so in the 32 block, uh, we mark another one. And uh, you know, in the 64 block, we mark a zero because there's, no, uh, there's no 64s uh, in our number. And then we continue this process. So we get uh, keep finding the highest power of two and subtracting it off until we get to um, our binary number. So in this case, 173 is going to be 10101101 in binary. And to convert that into hexadecimal, it's really simple. You just take uh, you just take uh, four bit, uh, four number, four digit chunks, uh, and you you just uh, convert them to the uh, corresponding hexadecimal digit. Uh, so in this case, it'll be AD because our first four digits, one, zero, one, zero, that corresponds to uh, 10 in decimal, which is A in hexadecimal. And the last four digits, 1101, one, one, that's 13, uh, which is D in hexadecimal. So our uh, base 16 number is going to be AD. Then uh, we, with numbers, we also have to deal with uh, negative numbers. Uh, this is pretty important because, you know, negative numbers, they, they are a thing. And if you don't deal with them properly, you could run into problems where uh, you think you're, you're subtracting a negative number but you're actually just adding it instead. And uh, you know, if you don't deal with this properly, you could uh, get some weird uh, math errors. And so the way we deal with this is generally twos complement. Um, you know, if you've taken M16 or CS33, uh, you probably know about this. Um, this is how we represent numbers in binary. And it's pretty simple to get from a regular binary to twos complement. Uh, step one is you write the number in binary. Step two, you invert all the bits. And step three, you just add one to the end. And again, this is just um, a, a way of consistently representing uh, negative numbers in a way that doesn't cause problems uh, when you try to add numbers together. Uh, so an example, uh, we're gonna try negative 28. Uh, so first we're gonna write 28 in binary, that's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. And then we invert everything. So we find the ones complement. So wherever there is a zero, you turn into a one. Whenever there's a one, you turn into a zero. So we get 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. And then last step, you add one and you get 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And again, this notation is consistent for both positive and negative numbers. So when you have things in two's complement of complement notation, you can just add them together. You don't have to worry about uh, the sign because it's going to work out in the end no matter what. And the special thing about this notation is that the first bit 
uh, acts as a sign bit. So if the first bit, uh, the leftmost bit, is a one, it's a negative number, and if it's uh, if it's a zero, it's a positive number. Uh, yeah. So again, consistent across all addition, you can just add numbers willy nilly, and the max range for your two's complement notation is going to be um, the negative two to the n minus one to positive two to the n minus one minus one. So that basically means if you have eight bits, uh, the, the, the maximum, the lowest number you can represent is negative two to the seventh. And the highest is positive two to the seventh minus one. Uh, I just think like, imagine you have one less bit because uh, the, the first bit again is the, is the sign bit. And if you're trying to read a two's complement number, uh, the way you should do that is uh, you turn the first bit uh, negative if it is. So uh, in this case, the, it's a negative number. So the first bit represents negative 256 and all the other bits afterwards uh, are positive. So you add all the numbers together and uh, you know we can see here we get negative 28, which, is, uh, which matches what we just did on the previous slide. And then if it starts with zero, you just read them normally. Okay, any questions up to here about his complement? Okay, cool. Just put them in if you have. Okay, then uh, one trick uh, regarding two's complement is that all ones is always negative one. Like you can kind of do this out yourself, just like logically, but uh, all ones has to be one, I mean negative one, and the way uh, to form negative numbers uh, using this information is uh, first you have uh, x plus uh, the inverse of x equals negative one. So whatever x is, if you invert it, you'll have you know like uh, if it's a one, the invert will the inverse will be zero, and if it's a zero, the inverse will be one. So if you add them together, it's definitely going to be negative one, and if you rearrange it. Uh, you get the inverse of x plus one equals negative x. So, you know, if you might notice that is basically what the, the process we did for, for two's complement, we inverted it and then added one and we got the negative, ver the negative uh, version of that number. So now that we've gone through kind of the basics of positive and negative numbers, we're gonna start with like how addition and how we represent addition in like real digital logic and real circuits. So first with binary addition, it works just like you were taught in like first grade about how to add numbers. So you can take the binary digits and you line them up and then you just add them uh, from lowest to highest. So in this example, we do seven plus two equals nine. You take the top number at seven, the second number is uh, two. You just add up the ones. If there's one plus one, you get, a, you get one zero. So you have to carry the one. And so it just works just like you would expect in decimal, nothing kind of tricky there. And then here, here we talk about carries, which is just like carrying the one in, carrying the one, carrying the two, whatever in uh, decimal. So hopefully that kind of makes sense to you all as well. So this is uh, the basic circuit that we have for addition is the half adder. So the half adder takes in two input, two, bit, two bits of input and outputs a sum bit and a carry bit. So then the half adder does also doesn't accept a carry in, but it has a carry out. So we have A and B, so you can think of those as either a one or a zero. And so you're going to output a sum value. And then you're also going to output a carry, which you can then propagate into, say, the next bit if you had multi-bit adders. Here we have a full adder, which kind of does basically the same thing, except this one actually does accept a carry in bit you can see right here. And so the circuit looks a lot more complicated. But actually, what you can see here, you still have your two inputs, the original inputs, and then a carry in input, but it's actually just two half adders put together. So 
you can see the, the first two sum kind of get, and essentially A and B get summed together, and then they get summed together with the carry in bit. And then we check if we have any more carries to get the carry out bit is basically what we have in our circuit. Any questions so far about half adders and full adders? All right, so then from this, we can actually make longer cascaded circuits. So you can see here, we have our example again of seven plus two equals nine. So first we start with the lowest position, one plus zero, and we get our one, and then we have our carry out bit, which is zero, which we then cascade into another full adder, which will sum our next two bits in the next spot. So that's one and one, and then another carry in, which is zero, you'll get your output is zero, and then another one, which is your carry right here. And then you just can do this process over and over again. And you'll see that when you take the individual sum bits, you get one, zero, zero, one, and then a, an extraneous carry out bit. So then you see our answer of one, zero, zero, one. And you can just repeat this process forever and ever and ever, or until you run out of space, which could happen. So then we also have a subtractor circuit. So subtractors actually are just like adders with one of their inputs negated. So you can think about a minus b is actually just a plus negative b. So if you want to build an, a subtractor, just build an adder with a, and then negate the first value or the second value actually. And just like we talked about in two's complement, it's pretty easy to negate your second value. You just flip all the bits and add one. But additionally, there are some subtractor circuits here too, which you can take a look at here and here, but those actually aren't needed because you just have adders. Yeah, and then you can see here a full subtractor is just like a half subtractor combined together. Same, same principle. So now multiplication. If you hate adding, here's some bad news. I enjoy this Naruto meme right here. So, uh, binary multiplication, when you're using unsigned numbers, so let's just imagine these are not negative numbers. Let's just imagine we're treating them like normal. And you can see you still have the same process of partial products that you probably learned in like second, third grade, where you kind of, you multiply one by each of these values, and then you add a zero, you multiply zero by each of these values, and then you drop down, and then you add two zeros, and then you multiply one by each of these values. So and then you do this and you get all your partial products and then you sum them together. And in this case, we have a decimal point. So we also move the decimal point, but if we didn't have a decimal point, you would, this would probably be just your answer. So that makes sense. Works just like decimal. We just have a different numbering system. But negative numbers can also ruin everything. So we need to tweak our procedure when it comes to multiplying negative numbers. So what's the first problem we run into when doing any type of multiplication? The issue is how many bits do we account for? So if I have, you know, if I have two four bit numbers, how many uh, bits does, do I need to, uh, to hold the output? So in this example, the maximum we will ever need is eight bits. But the, for example, if we have two bit numbers, then the minimum we may need is two bits. So whenever we're multiplying two numbers together, the maximum number of bits we need is m plus n, where m is the number, the bits of the first number and n is the number of bits in the second number. And then the minimum we'll ever need is just the maximum of m or n. We also have a little trick when it comes to multiplying and dividing by powers of two. So when we multiply by powers of two, that's actually just like shifting all the bits over and then adding a zero because remember every digit is just a power of two. So when we add a new digit, that's multiplying by powers of two when we shift it over and add zero. And the same thing goes for division. You can just shift it over to the right. And then what you would do is take your most significant bit and make that make kind of extend that. So that's a cool trick when it comes to multiplying and dividing by powers of two. Any questions? I saw some some questions in the chat or something in the chat. 
Oh, okay. That was just about David's fingers. Okay, so here, you know, if you are trying to multiply uh, two numbers together, if you just allocate like your output to be n plus n, a size n plus n, uh, then you'll never have a problem. You'll never have a problem where uh, your output is too large uh, for whatever you're storing it in. So let's say we want to multiply by like negative five times negative four. Um, and let's say we uh, are trying to store our product uh, to be, we're, our, we're trying to get our product to be six bits. So we're only saving six bits. Uh, so the first thing we should do is we should sign extend uh, the factors to P bits. So in this case, P equals six. So we'd like to copy the sign bit into the higher bits. So just uh, for negative five, the first sign, the first bit is one, that's the sign bit. So we just kind of smear it to the left until we get to uh, a six bit number. And then for negative four, again, the sign bit is one. So we again smear it to the left. And now we have uh, two six bit numbers. Next, uh, we just multiply like before. We just use the, you know, the partial products thing. And uh, the key here is we only take the first uh, P bits of the product. So in this case, we take the first six bits. And you can see here on the multiplication at the bottom, we get uh, the right answer, which is positive 20, not negative 20. And you know, that's just uh, the simplest way to, uh, to multiply uh, sign numbers uh, in general. And uh, with this idea, there's also kind of multipl uh, multiplication circuits. Um, they're kind of more involved than adders, I would say. Uh, I'm going to let Brandon explain this because I don't really like looking at this picture. <laughs> yeah, so David doesn't like looking at this picture, so he has another one on the next slide, but this kind of makes sense to me. So here you can see these kind of two, these ands, and then you can see this diagonal right here. So if you kind of imagine it just like um, the previous one, each of these lines of the circuit represents one of your partial products. So the reason we do this is the and is basically your multiply, because what's if you do if you multiply zero and one, it's the same thing as zero and one. And if you do one plus one times one, that's one, but that's the same thing as one and one. So you can see this. A, a, uh, a, the B0 would be like your second number. So like in this case, let's say one right here. And then A0 is your first number. So you multiply the least significant bit by the entire first number. And then you add that to your next partial product, which will be the second bit times the first number. And you just keep doing that propagation all the way to the end. And at the bottom, you get the sum of the partial products, which is your answer. But if this is too confusing, uh, I like it because I can see how the partial products work. But if this is too confusing, David also has another way to look at it right here. Yeah, so this is more like a, like a block diagram kind of way of looking at it. It's just like, um, you can see kind of uh, this, the partial sum, which is like, propagating through, you know, like you have a, like on every like level of partial product, you got to like add it all up and by the end you'll get, um, you just get the number you want. And I just like, you know, I just, I just like looking at this more. Sorry, Brandon. But I mean, if this makes more sense to you, like when you're looking at it and you're trying to implement it, uh, you know, like more power to you. You know, if the other one makes more sense, then just do that because uh, they, they're both the same thing in the end. Then, okay, any questions here about adding, multiplication, whatever, math? All right, complete silence. All right, amazing. So now we're gonna talk about um, pipelining, I guess. Pipelining is a way to make uh, repeated operations faster. So what I mean by this is, so we're gonna consider the 
uh, cascaded adder that we talked about just before this, uh, the ripple carry adder. And this is basically, you know, adders in, in series. So each adder just calculates the result for uh, that place value, and then it passes uh, the carry out bit into the next adder. And that adder just calculates the result for its place value, and then it goes on and on and on. And so, uh, so this design is like simple to implement. You know, it's uh, it's just adders in series, and it's also pretty slow because you know each adder has to. Um, I can tell. I can tell Ben, and he's uh, really paying attention here. Uh, each adder has to complete what it's doing before um, before the next adder can actually operate. So if Brandon would like to change the slide and then again. Um, so a way to make this faster uh, and to re avoid that problem where, you know, each adder has to basically, is basically doing nothing while it's waiting for the previous uh, operations to go through is we want to, well, we want to pipeline uh, this, this module. And so if you think about assembly lines where kind of everyone does a small job uh, that builds into this, this big job, uh, it could go a lot faster. So instead of just one module does one thing, instead we have all the modules are doing this one small task that eventually builds uh, into the final result. Um, so then after that, uh, Uh, so the idea of um, so the idea is uh, we want to separate each operation into stages, and uh, we need registers between each stage to save intermediate values. So now that there's registers, this is turned into from uh, combinational logic into sequential logic. And the reason why we need the registers is because we need to make sure that we are saving the intermediate values between each, each stage. And uh, you'll kind of see what I mean by this uh, after we kind of go through a little demonstration of, uh, of, of what pipelining actually looks like. Yeah, so here we have uh, basically a pipeline four bit adder. So on the left, you can see I have four different sums that I want to carry out. So I'll have the, let's say, A plus B, each of which are four bits. Then I have C plus D, each of which are four bits, and they'll make Y. E and F will make Z. G and H will make W. So I have four different inputs. Now, if I did this without pipelining, I would have to run through this entire circuit once. So I would have to go through all the four adders once before I can even step to the next number and then I would go through all the ad adders at once and then again and again I have to do the whole series four times but now we're going to consider pipelining so first in here we're going to have our parallel adder so in our first full adder we have to add our lowest significant bits so a1 and b1 and then you can see the rest are just going to hold their values and then what's happening next is that you see x1 got the result from the previous full adder, and we just carry that on to the next step. But while we're carrying this on to the next step, the previous step can actually go ahead and start the next number, C1 and D1. So then you can see that while X1 processes its second bit, C1 and D1 will process their first bit. And then you do that again. X1 and X2 have been processed. It's processing its third bit. C, C1 and D1 have processed into Y1. And now, because that's done, we actually can start our third number, E1 and F1. And then we just keep doing that. You can see we've met, now we're on the third bit for one number, the second bit, or we're on the fourth bit for one number, the, sec, the third bit for the next number, the second bit for our third sum, and the la first bit for our uh, last sum. So you can see how this kind of saves time because while one is processing, the next one can process its smaller part. And so up in this last step, we have our full sum here, and then we're close to having our full sum in this one, and then we're st still working our way through on the other ones. 
but rather than basically, and now basically instead of running through the whole circuit four times, which I would say is like 16 four adder operations, we're now basically four plus one more here, plus two more here, plus three more here. So that's uh, four plus three plus two plus one, something, I don't know, some number, 10. So you can see how it actually makes it much more efficient. Uh, so like even quick, though we're talking- Wait, real quick, does anyone have questions about how this actually works? Because I know the first time I looked at this, like it made no sense to me. So I just want to ask, does anyone have any questions about uh, like the actual implementation of pipelining and what the process is actually doing? Okay, cool. I guess I'm just a monkey. All right, so even though we're talking about pipelining, sometimes it's not always good because when we make our pipelines, we obviously take up more space. We have uh, the circuitry that's more complex and more overhead from maintaining the registers and clock cycles. So the general question we should always ask ourselves if we want the pipeline is when is pipelining good? And that's either when the operation is repeatedly executed, if you can divide the operation into smaller independent stages, and the stages are similar in length and complexity. So why we want to consider that is in this example, say, we have our pipelining circuit. Let's say we have a sum. The first stage takes, or first stage takes 10 seconds, let's say. The second stage takes 30 seconds, and the third stage takes 20 seconds. So overall, that would be 60 seconds. So you can see without a pipeline, we're going to take 60 seconds to do one thing, 60 seconds to do the next thing, and then 60 seconds to do the third thing. But with pipelining, our slowest stage determines how well our pipeline performs. So now take this example where we have all these lined up. So you can see in the first, uh, first, state, first set of inputs, it doesn't really matter. But in the second in set of inputs, this red one, you can see that because this stage in the previous output takes 30 seconds, for 20 seconds, we're doing nothing right here. And then Similarly with the blue, similarly when we're up here, if this takes 30 seconds. So in here we have 10 seconds where it's doing nothing. So you can see each stage has to take 30 seconds, even though independently they would not run for 30 seconds. So this actually increases something we call latency, which we'll talk about in the next slide, but it also increases something we'll talk about in the next slide called throughput which you can see rather in about the same amount of time, we do five numbers as, or five inputs as opposed to three inputs right here. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about timing, how it relates to uh, the pipelining. So how fast is fast? We talk about like our system is fast. You talk about how your CPUs are a certain gigahertz, but what exactly are we measuring? So we, we're talking about we talked about, I talked about this in the last slide, we talked about latency and throughput. So latency is the overall time it takes to start and complete one operation, whereas the throughput is the number of operations you can do in a unit of time, so operations per time. Basically, throughput measures the time for overall operations, while the latency measures the time for individual operations. So if we go back to our previous example, the latency without pipelining is 60 seconds. But for with a pipeline, because this, because we have to wait for the slowest stage each time, one, one independent circuit will run 30 plus 30 plus 30, which is now 90 seconds. So you can see how that's actually longer for one independent operation. But the throughput is larger because we can see five inputs instead of three by the end of it. So in the ripple carry adder, which you remember is kind of a not pipeline version, the latency is low because we just do the incoming operation once and we don't have to wait for anything else. But the throughput is also low since we have to like wait for the previous output uh, to carry on the, or we have to wait for the previous output to be finished to carry out the next output. But in our pipeline adder, the latency is high since we have to split it into multiple chunks and wait that time for each step but the throughput is high since we can, once we finish one step, we can already carry on the next operation in the next step. So that's how latency and throughput is affected by pipelining.
Does that make sense? Any questions? Wait, so uh, in general, is it better to have um, low latency but high throughput? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so low late, yeah, low latency and high throughput is um, obviously the best way situation to go for. Um, but sometimes when you're questioning whether I should or shouldn't pipeline, you can obviously, it, it will, when, you sh when you take something that's not pipelined and then you try to pipeline it, the likelihood is that your latency will increase just a little bit. Because rather than having independent stages, you'll have to basically say multiple of one stage, if that makes sense. So rat in this example, rather than having 10, 30, 20, you're now going to have when you pipeline it, since the slowest is 30, you'll basically have 30, 30, 30. So you can see how the latency for one input is longer. Yeah. But yes, generally, the best thing the, to do would be low latency, high throughput. OK. Um, and in that picture that you just showed, uh, what would be the, the throughput? Um, it's kind of, It would be kind of hard to tell because we have like we we're not actually we don't have like real sets of time um you know this could be 20 seconds 20 nanoseconds 20 milliseconds it'd be hard to tell just from these kind of arbitrary numbers um but you can kind of see visually here how with about the same amount of time the throughput kind of increases from like three to five somethings oh okay i got you Any other questions? Nope. OK, I guess with that, David, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so no, the lab, the last lab so of the quarter, calculator lab, amazing. Uh, it's basically using the concepts we just talked about, so like adder, multiplier, uh, pipelining, and it, it, we're just going to be using that to build a pretty simple calculator module. And kind of the goal of this lab is just to get you more familiar with uh, uh, how kind of uh, these modules like work together and how they interact and how uh, you know you can use different modules uh, in your design to get what you want to do. And again, uh, as usual, the spec is going to be posted with the slides uh, on the Facebook. And uh, don't wait to start it, please, because uh, you may have realized already, but the internet is a pretty bad source for Verilog. Um, most of the posts are just made by like 50 something year old EEs who don't do anything besides Verilog. Um, and it's pr it's like not that helpful most of the time. Uh, yeah. So anyway, it's due. It's gonna be due week ten on Monday, and there's probably oh, no. I think uh, I have to look, I, I think there's gonna be an intermediate checkpoint uh, before then. And so as always, don't be afraid to ask us questions. Like we're here to hey. help you. You know if you're. Me? suffer if you're like struggling and exorbitant amount that's like not what we want we want you to um you know have a good time haha -ha. anyway there's a verilog syntax cheat sheet uh included on the spec and it's also in the facebook group so if you need help with verilog syntax that's a really good uh, resource for you all right any Thoughts, comments, questions, ruminations, violent reactions. Nope. If that, if we have no questions, I'm going to stop the recording.